People have accepted, so the room should be overflowing, but I think the weather and traffic has something to do with it. But we have some time constraints, so I'm, I'm going to um, begin. Uh, my name is Blair Rubel. I'm director of the Wilson Center's Comparative Urban Studies Project. And on behalf of my colleagues, Lauren Hertzer, Allison Garland, and Samantha Raditz, I'd like to welcome you all here. Uh, I remind people to turn off electronic communication devices, cell phones, Blackberries, they interfere with the sound system. We're going to have um, a bit of musical chairs because um, two of our speakers are going to have to leave in about an hour. So what, uh, after a brief introduction, I'm going to turn the floor over to uh, Representative Miller and then uh, Representative Price. Uh, and then we'll have a short question and answer period for them because they will have to leave earlier. Then we'll, we'll pick up the discussion with the other panelists. Um, I, I think everyone who's in this room has heard all the numbers before. Uh, some 3.3 billion people, more than half the world's population, now lives in cities. Global poverty increasingly is becoming an urban phenomenon. Um, in 2002, 746 million city dwellers lived on $2 a day or less, and that number has undoubtedly increased since that calculation was made. Uh, the absolute number of poor people living in cities has increased faster than those living in rural areas for nearly two decades. Urban inequality is becoming more widespread, uh, with measures of inequality growing most rapidly in cities with lower income levels. And much of this growth is taking place in huge self-built districts, which present their own challenges because they're emerging on a previously unknown scale. These are global phenomena, and yet the response is often local. But if the scale of the challenge is global, then local responses are insufficient. And we need to begin to think about these questions globally. Now, while I know most of you in this room, if not all of you, have heard all of this before, I also suspect that many of you have heard the counter arguments. Um, the figures tend to sail over people's heads. Uh, the appearance of an Oscar award winning movie kind of gives, changes the discussion a little bit. But still the general reaction, particularly here in the United States has been, well, this is horrible, but it's, a, it's not my problem. It's a problem that's far away. I have more immediate concerns which usually is true. People do have more media concerns, and yet there are counter arguments. Um, one, for people who are religious, is simply we're all God's children. For Americans, uh, our, founding, our founders did write about all humans being endowed with certain unalienable rights, and if slum dwellers are humans, then they have the same rights as everybody else. Um, but often it's the last line of defense, the most egocentric line of defense, uh, which makes a difference, which is simply if urban poverty is a global phenomena and the poor inhabit the same planet we do and breathe the same air we do, then informal settlements are not like Las Vegas. What happens in an informal settlement doesn't stay in an informal settlement. And obviously over the past couple of weeks, we've had some evidence of that. Uh, I think probably most of you know someone or know someone who knows someone or at least know someone who knows someone who knows someone who's had a, ch a child out of school because of the H1N1 flu. Um, which as we read yesterday in the Washington Post, emerged from the most populous and densely inhabited communities uh, in Mexico City. So uh, clearly such immediate egocentric arguments are sometimes make us feel uncomfortable, but the fact of the matter is informal settlements are not merely local problems, they're now global problems. <clears throat> And that's why I'm thrilled to be uh, able to host this event. Um, 
On a personal note, as the son of a Tar Heel and the husband of a Tar Heel and a graduate of a great Tar Heel University, I am thrilled that this initiative is being taken by two representatives of the Old North State. Um, and when you die, you'll be a Tar Heel dead. And when I die, I'll be a Tar Heel dead, that's right. Um, when I was a student in North Carolina I, uh, a long time ago, I don't think I could imagine that congressmen from the state of North Carolina would have an interest in a subject like this. Uh, that was a very different time. But clearly uh, what I just said about uh, the, the challenges of urban poverty being global uh, means that the world has changed and North Carolina has changed. and. Uh, if, for those of you who know North Carolina, you'll understand how much it's changed when you hear from uh, Congressman Brad Miller and Congressman David Price. Uh, I'm not going to give long um, biographical introductions. Their biographies are in the hands out, handouts that you have. Uh, but um, I want to say that it's an honor to be able to introduce both of them, as well as Peter Kim and Chris Williams, who are old friends of our program. So because the congressmen have to leave in about an hour, I'm going to turn the floor immediately over to Congressman Miller. Do I need to press something? Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this uh, impressive uh, panel. Uh, I do want to thank Blair Rubel and the Woodrow Wilson Center for hosting the event. Um, and I first became interested in this issue, the issue of shelter slums and urban poverty as a foreign affairs foreign aid uh, issue as a result of a congressional delegation uh, that I went on in August of 2007. Um, uh, Nita Lowy, the chair of the Foreign Ops Subcommittee of, um, of the Appropriations Committee, was leading the, um, was leading the uh, congressional delegation, the CODEL, and uh, she was looking desperately at the last minute for other members to to, uh, to go, and I had been at a dinner with her two nights before, so I got a last-minute call to see if I would uh, just up and go to Africa with her, and I accepted. Um, the trip included a, a stop in Nairobi, uh, which was principally kind of our reward at the end of the trip. We, we'd gone to places like Liberia and northern Uganda, which are not traditionally uh, vacation destinations. Uh, but Nairobi is, and we did spend some time in a game park, and we did shopping for um, uh, African crafts. Uh, but we had one morning uh, to make it look respectable so we wouldn't end up being slammed in the Washington Pro Post for having gone on a junket. Uh, we spent a morning in Kibera, um, and I did not know that much about Kibera. Uh, on the plane, uh, I was a reasonably diligent student, and I'd read the Congressional Research Service, the CRS, briefing paper on Kenya, uh, which said that Kenya was a, was a stable society, as certainly as African societies uh, went, uh, but there were continuing problems with urban poverty and with corruption. Uh, and my image of corruption was sort of the American image of corruption, which was kind of low-level uh, government bureaucrats getting a little vigorish um, from uh, from corporations, from businesses. So it actually, uh, there, were, there are some historians uh, admittedly kind of a, from a left perspective who call the kind of uh, corruption that existed in urban machines in the early part of the century good graft uh, because it helped move relatively new immigrants up economically uh, by collecting from those who already were doing well. Uh, and that's sort of what I imagine by corruption. Uh, we visited, uh, started out by visiting a group of NGOs, I think including Carolina and Cabrera, um, and others uh, in Kibera, and uh, we met with a group of what were called structure owners or permit holders, uh, and then the residents. Um, and that was a great step forward that the two groups were coming together. Um, and I started asking questions about, I mean, we heard that, that Kibera was all government land and it had begun as an informal settlement, simply squatting. Um, and I began to ask who were the permit holders, that the people who lived there now paid rent to the permit holders, to the structure owners, and who are these guys? Were they the ones who originally squatted and then were given a permit to do what they'd been doing? Um, and the, the crowd, the group we were talking to became very tense. Um, it became apparent that they really wanted me to change the subject, that that was not something they wanted to talk about. 
and it became apparent that the permits were simply given to well-placed people, uh, had no particular uh, connection to Cabrera, and just showed up and said, if you want to keep living here, you've got to pay me rent. Um, and they owned the structures. We, we walked through Kibera. Um, probably most of the people here have walked through Kibera. Um, and it is uh, something to behold. There's a population of 1.2 million people living on about um, three quarters the size of Central Park, all on one story. Uh, the structures are obviously have no foundation at all. They're simply corrugated steel, steel or plywood nailed together. Uh, no water, no sewer, um, but just a few feet square, uh, no electricity, um, uh, no, f no, uh, no roads really uh, through, uh, the, uh, through Kibera, just a, a muddy footpath. Um, and having just heard that the folks who were living there were actually paying rent uh, to live there to someone who had no connection, no, nothing that we would have seen as a, a just entitlement uh, to that land or to that permit um, and, and looking at the structures and understanding that the total cost of building one of those structures, not surprisingly, was well less than one year's rent. Uh, we all ask ourselves, how can this be a stable society? Um, and I think we learned a few months later, I think four months later when they had their election, what appeared obviously from our perspective, uh, from our distance, a stolen election. Uh, in which the incumbent party uh, was in fact voted out, but um, they had control of how the ballots were counted, and they decided that they'd won after all. Uh, and then uh, there was a post-election violence, uh, more than 1,000 people dead, uh, 300,000 people displaced, uh, a, a hurriedly uh, organized uh, coalition government of the outs and the ins uh, that now seems to be unraveling. Um, and I heard that more than a billion people about a sixth of the world's population now live in slums um, like Kibera. Uh, the next year I came back again to, to Kenya with a, on a congressional delegation of Codell that David Price led, um, which actually worked out. I did not go to Kibera on that occasion. It worked out famously well for me. We needed to split our delegation that day and half go visit a village, a rural village in Kenya, and half go to Kibera. Well, the visit to Kibera was by far the sexier option. Um, but because I had been the year before, I, I volunteered not to go, to go to, to, to the village. Um, and David led the group that went to Kibera, uh, and there was a torrential rain. I had beautiful weather in the village. There was an absolutely torrential rain in Kibera. Everyone was entirely soaked. Uh, the the, the uh, delegation was accompanied by one of the house physicians who was panicked at what was in the mud um, from, obviously, from the, we have 1.2 million people living that close together with no water or sewer, uh, there's something to worry about. Um, but I still got credit for having been the, the team player uh, and having agreed not to go uh, to Kibera. Uh, but we, we did work, my office, Ashley Orr is here, uh, worked closely with NGOs uh, and realized that given the imp increasing importance of of urban uh, poverty, of, of people living in slums just like Kibera. Uh, and I think we heard from people who've been to Soweto that actually Kibera was relatively luxurious as African slums, um, slums went, um, that that needed to be much more of a focus of our foreign assistance. Uh, I've spoken to Howard Berman, the chairman of the committee, I'm, I'm a member of the committee, uh, on inc including uh, the bill that I've introduced along with David um, the, uh, the, the Shelter Land and Urban Management Assistance Act, um, SLUM, it's all about acronyms and naming bills in Congress, uh, as part of a broader foreign aid uh, reauthorization. And certainly the trip through Kibera uh, gave us an insight in some of what we needed to do, obviously providing basic services like water and sewer and electricity and health, uh, but more fundamentally, the lack of secure tenure. Uh, nobody knew that they could continue to live in the same place from one day to the next. Uh, if they improved it, uh, the, the structure owner, the permit holder might well decide, you know, you really, since you've now got a nicer structure, you should pay me more rent or I'll rent it to someone else. Um, and on that trip, uh, not just in, in Kenya, but in northern Uganda and other conflict areas of Africa, 
uh, we really learned how foreign the concept of land title is, uh, which villages lived on land, um, uh, farmed the land. Uh, no one had any conception of, of, um, of owning the land except that their village or their tribe owned the land. Uh, and in conflict areas like northern Uganda or southern Sudan or uh, Liberia, uh, people who had been displaced uh, and uh, during the conflict returned to where they had <coughs> lived before and found other people now farming the same land that they had farmed. And they had no way to sort through uh, just the dispute. Um, it also means that there's absolutely no incentive uh, to improving um, living conditions if you cannot be assured that you will continue uh, to stay there. Um, obviously, the uh, focus on our policy, on our politics, the next little bit will be on our own economic difficulties. Uh, but uh, we do need to be concerned about what is happening in the rest of the world. The, 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 um, the half of people who already live um, uh, in urban areas around the world, the, the one one-sixth of the world's population that already lives in urban slums, um, and the, the most impoverished parts of the world are urbanizing most quickly, uh, and that needs to become um, more and more of a focus for our foreign policy. Uh, so I hope that uh, this legislation will, will, will almost certainly not pass. I did not introduce it with the intention that it would pass as a freestanding bill, but will be incorporated in part of a broader foreign aid a reform package uh, that Howard Berman has introduced. Um, so with that. Okay. <coughs> Congressman Price. It, it's, it's, on. it's on. All right. Thank you. Um, I'm very uh, pleased to be here with, with all of you. And, and uh, we, while it's true that we do have to, uh, to take off, as, uh, as we often do, uh, earlier than we would like, I'm hoping to... Uh, to stay around long enough to hear our other uh, presenters and to uh, appreciate some of the expertise that's on the other side of the table here. And then uh, I also hope that as, as, uh, as discussions on this continue and as our deliberations in, in Congress continue, we can uh, have the benefit of your, of your counsel because uh, I, uh, I do think we're at a, at a point now where we have um, a chance, an unusual chance, to influence the, the future direction of, of, of foreign assistance, the way it's structured, the way it's prioritized, and I, and I do believe what we're talking about here today needs to enter our consciousness, and uh, that's why I'm happy to join with Brad and, and other members in, in pushing this uh, legislation forward, as he says, not so much as a freestanding measure, but to uh, influence the broader debate and hopefully be part of the final uh, legislation. Uh, I want to thank the Woodrow Wilson Center, as, as uh, the center so often does, uh, organizing a panel on a, on a critical and, and, and neglected topic. Um, uh, Brad Miller has really offered good leadership in this area, and it's a pleasure to work with him. Uh, look forward to hearing from Peter Kim and Chris Williams, who've done remarkable work in addressing uh, this issue. My uh, consciousness raising, personally, uh, is uh, is uh, very similar to, uh, to to Brad's, and it and it does uh, go back to. Uh, to our work in Africa with the House Democracy Assistance Commission. That's a, a parliament-to-parliament -parliament, uh, uh, support body, which I chair. Uh, some of you may remember back in the early 90s, the Frost uh, Commission, which worked with the uh, showcase parliaments of uh, Eastern Europe as they had all of a sudden to become real parliaments. And member-to-member, uh, -member, staff to staff, uh, we, we offered... Uh, uh, valuable assistance, uh, I, I believe, and, and uh, they will tell us that here uh, 15 years later. Valuable assistance in, in getting those parliaments up and up and running. I uh, thought for a long time we, uh, we should uh, be renewing that effort, and, and four years ago we did. David Dreyer initially chaired the commission. I chair it now, and we're working in 12 uh, uh, emerging or re-emerging democracies ar around the world including uh, two in Africa, two very different countries in Africa. One, uh, one Liberia, which uh, uh, for the first time in its history has, uh, we believe, a fighting chance for something other than strongman rule. And with the parliament being a necessary component of that, we feel like uh, we really must be trying to help that parliament uh, build capacity. And then Kenya, which uh, is, a, is, of course, a pivotal country, a country that has had some successful democratic transitions, but uh, is uh, in great peril now, I believe. 
and uh, here too, the functioning of that parliament is uh, is going to be critical to uh, to the kind of shape of uh, Kenyan democracy and and indeed whether it uh, whether it survives. And uh, so it was uh, on one of those trips to Kenya, in in my case, in in 2006, that I first witnessed uh, Kibera. And there is a direct constituency tie here. We have a group of remarkable. Uh, uh, College students who who started this uh, this nonprofit in in Kibera started out as a as a soccer league. Uh, remarkable undergraduate doing a, a senior project there started organizing kids in his vicinity to uh, to uh, w- around sports. And uh, long story short, here a number of years later, this is a cinder block uh, presence in the uh, in the slum with now a a, a health clinic, a, a rather um, uh, amazing health clinic probably the most substantial building in sight, a health clinic near, nearby, <clears throat> where a range of uh, programs, not they still have the soccer league, but they uh, have a range of uh, microcredit and um, crafts, uh, health, uh, health, various kinds of health programs. It's, 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 a, it's a very, very constructive presence in a very difficult uh, community. But, uh, but I, too, have been exposed to uh, Cabrera and... Uh, uh, it's hard not to be moved by that experience, and, and then, as Brad said, we did go back in the rain uh, uh, two years later, which is even 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 more memorable. Uh, <clears throat> it's true the uh, the doctor was about as nervous as I've ever seen in anyone. He uh, I, no more nervous actually than I, uh, because we happened to have uh, uh, a female member of Congress and two spouses in the in the party, and and they weren't exactly dressed for this uh, occasion. And I, uh, I was mainly thankful that no one slipped and fell in, in the course of this, uh, of this memorable uh, tour. Uh, but, uh, but seriously, the the, uh, the 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 effect is just over overwhelming. And I, I'm sure this is something that is not news to 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 you. But uh, we were stunned by what we witnessed. And uh, I, I remember visiting an eight foot by eight foot mud brick home where a, where a mother lived with her school aged son. We we visited the health clinic with the thousands of residents being served uh, no stable source of water or electricity brad said no electricity actually a few people do have electricity but they pay a fortune for uh, for getting that electricity uh, uh it, it, it the the the, the uh, economic uh, structure of the place is 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 absolutely uh bizarre it's home to uh, an estimated one million inhabitants uh, almost overwhelming problems uh, but there is an intricate set of dynamics here where the problems and the root causes are all uh, inseparable. Sanitation, public health, access to transportation, employment, secure tenure, adequate housing, environmental degradation, ethnic conflict. They're all tied up there, all in, a, in, a, in, a, in an intricate uh, kind of uh, pattern of interdependence. They're both cause and consequence of the Kabaran slum. Now, there is good work going on there. We all know that, uh, uh, including some of some remarkable efforts, as, such as the one I just described. Uh, we were shocked, though, when we were there to learn that uh, USAID then had not one single program at work in uh, in Cabrera. <clears throat> Hard to imagine how how that could be justified, just on the face of it. As it turned out, the justification was, at least in part, a lack of funds. Uh, USAID's Urban programs have been decimated in in recent years. Moreover, our current array of foreign aid programs is ill-suited to confront the challenge of urban slums. These programs uh, often take on the challenges piecemeal. They may target water access or public health, and and such efforts are are, are critical. But uh, I think our sense is, in in trying to approach this this, uh, problem uh, anew is that a, a, a more robust and a more integrated approach is uh, is called for if we can figure out how to how to uh, bring bring that about uh, congressman miller has introduced the slum act um, it's an important first step i think i think it can be an important first step in enhancing u.s tools to address the challenge of of slums and urbanization i, I really hope that you and others will, will latch on to this and, and and make the most of this uh, opening that we feel we have uh, this legislation would help us develop a long-term strategy for taking on the challenges and um, would kickstart efforts in the short term by authorizing additional aid. As we work uh, for passage of this SLUM Act, we are, we're mindful that more far-reaching changes are also needed. 
Um, certainly, President Obama's promise to double U.S. foreign assistance is, is, is one such uh, necessary change. In addition, as, uh, as, as Brad mentioned, Congress is beginning to undertake, uh, examine the prospect of a full-scale reform for our foreign aid programs. It's not quite clear at this point what uh, the full dimensions of that might be. But I, I think as we undertake uh, this effort, it's absolutely critical to recalibrate these programs to more effectively address cross-cutting challenges like uh, global slums. Uh, reforms are needed not only to enhance major donor agencies like uh, USAID and the Millennium Challenge Account, but also to reinvigorate international programs operated by other agencies that have a potential to do more, such as uh, the Department of Housing and Urban Development's uh, Office of International Affairs. Equally important is having a coherent strategy to guide our assistance so that aid funding is allocated in a way that mirrors our, our national priorities. Our work with the Democracy uh, Commission has taken us to a number of countries wrestling with large, impoverished uh, slums. Uh, we have a, a delegation going to Haiti uh, this very week. Uh, we're uh, working in, in Afghanistan, Indonesia, and, and, and so on. And, 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 of course, one thing that's striking about uh, these places is that the context, the contours of the slums are, are, are different. They're not the same everywhere. But... Uh, the challenges and needs often are, are, are quite similar. So let me just finally offer a few thoughts based on these observations and this experience that uh, I hope might contribute to this emerging debate. First, the complex and interwoven challenges of global slums, as I said, d demand integrated and holistic solutions. USAID and other foreign aid agencies already address many of the problems that slum dwellers face, including poverty reduction and water access and adequate sanitation and education. But these programs would be far more effective if they were planned and funded and implemented in an integrated uh, fashion. In some ways, the President's uh, Emergency Program for AIDS Relief, or PEPFAR, might serve as a, 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 as a good example of, of, a, of a more integrated approach. I. Uh, I recently convened uh, a panel in my, my district of uh, really a remarkable array of, of people who in one way or another are involved in, uh, in foreign aid programs, in, in administering uh, f foreign aid, uh, this country's foreign aid efforts. And uh, they, they, did, um, they did bring in a, uh, a very positive view of, of the difference that PEPFAR had made, both as a way of, of giving uh, uh, that these global health uh, uh, challenges a, a certain focus and a certain priority, but also at least up to a point in, in uh, uh, coordinating the efforts of numerous governors, government agencies targeting various aspects of the problem, including uh, the prevention of transmission, uh, treating infected patients, improving foreign health infrastructure, and attending to uh, orphans of the, of the pandemic. Now, I'm well aware that the PEPFAR model of coordination also has its flaws and its shortcomings, but um, it may offer some lessons for carrying out a more holistic, multi-sector uh, program in an integrated fashion. Secondly, while they present similar challenges and needs, uh, each slum has its own unique character and effectively uh, addressing the challenges of slums is going to require a good deal of flexibility uh, to facilitate uh, local solutions. Um, our uh, commission saw a, a, a good example of this principle when we traveled to, uh, to Colombia and looked in on the city, city of uh, Medellin uh, there, too. I'm sure a number of you have been there. It used to be uh, designated the most dangerous uh, city in the world. It's, it's quite a different place now, remarkably different. Uh, the former mayor of Medellin oversaw the construction of the Metro uh, Cable, a cable car servicing uh, some of the poorest slum neighborhoods ringing the city. Um, the Metro Cabia links the uh, links with the ground-based public transportation system in the valley, but it, it goes up this ex extraordinarily uh, steep uh, mountainside, populated by hundreds of thousands of people. Um, it provides those residents with access to jobs and opportunities in the Senate Center, city center. Uh, the result has been a staggering 300 percent increase in commerce. The creation of significant new green space a total makeover of, uh, of this huge teeming uh, neighborhood. In what was once one of the most dangerous neighborhoods in the world's most dangerous city, uh, I recently had the opportunity and observed others having the opportunity to, to walk around in broad daylight without uh, the slightest fear. 
So we need to find ways to encourage such local solutions, even when they don't fall neatly into existing program categories. And we need to improve our ability to incorporate local input into our program planning and uh, execution. Finally, we must rebuild our in-house technical capacity at USAID. In the past several years, USAID's technical expertise, especially in the area of urban problems, but also throughout other key areas, has simply been decimated. Much of the loss is being mitigated by contractors who've often done admirable work in implementing U.S. programs. However, without in-house expertise, we lack institutional memory, we lose the capacity to steer foreign aid programs down sound technical paths. As we examine foreign aid reform, we must re-examine the balance of in-house versus, versus contracted expertise, and we uh, need to ensure to, that we retain sufficient government capacity to maintain the technical integrity of our programming. So uh, let, me, let me stop there and, and turn with interest to our other panelists. Uh, again, I do appreciate the opportunity to be here today and look forward to our further discussion. I think it's quite important. Thank you. Um, we're on schedule, and we have about a half hour, so I, I think since the congressman would like to hear from Peter and from Chris, maybe um, we'll, we'll go right to them, and then hopefully we'll have a little time for questions before the congressman have to leave. Peter? Okay. <clears throat> uh, as about, I guess, two-thirds of you know, uh, I'm Peter Kim, and I'm the chairman of the uh, International Housing Coalition. The International Housing Coalition is an advocacy organization. Our mantra is housing for all. And here in our early years, we're in our fourth year now, uh, the all we're focusing on is slum dwellers. That's, that's the people we're interested in providing housing for. Um, we uh, are a coalition of about 35 organizations, some not-for-profit, some trade associations, some academic with a serious interest in this issue. Our founding sponsors were Habitat for Humanity and the U.S. Realtors and the Canadian Realtors. Habitat for Humanity is, recommend, is uh, represented here this morning by Liz Blake, their VP and General Counsel, and by Chris Vincent, their Director of Legislative Affairs, who also is a graduate of North Carolina. I don't know if that's a coincidence or not. Perhaps not. Uh, what I'd like to do with, uh, with my few minutes is make, first of all, I, I couldn't uh, imagine a piece of legislation that we in the International Housing Coalition would rather see on the floor of the Congress than the one that these two gentlemen at the table here have presented. I want to thank them for that. And from each of their presentations, they, they indicated a pretty good grasp of what, what the fundamental issues are. So what I'd like to do with my time is take a few minutes to tell you the history of aid, what, what we had done, and, and what, what needs to be, what, what uh, would be possible steps that would have to be taken to get it back to where it was. Uh, as an advocacy organization, we, we, uh, we support any action that would be good for uh, slum dwellers, and not just AID, but the actions by the host country governments, actions by the World Bank and other institutions. But right now, with the change of administrations, the key opportunity is, is, is USAID and, and the potential for change in U.S. foreign policy and U.S. priorities. Uh, all of the aid agencies, uh, without exception that I'm aware of, say that their principal goal is to the alleviation of poverty. Yet they, they have organized themselves in a way that they don't have much of a shot at the poverty of the people living in slums. They come at it a bunch of different ways. They slice the budget up uh, in accordance to health and governance, and each of them pursues its priorities. But as uh, Congressman Price said, that, that there's no coherent strategy uh, that, uh, that, that guides how, how to get to the poor people. It's also true that the uh, uh, second universal goal of aid agencies is economic growth. Uh, you, you need, in addition to making the sharing of the pie fairer, there needs to be a bigger pie if you're going to get anywhere with poverty. And the pretty much universal agreement among economists that the urbanization and economic growth go hand in hand, and the, the uh, 
a good management of the cities, including good management of the slums, is just an important feature of, of economic growth and urban development. Right now, a very hefty percentage of the uh, economic growth money in the U.S. foreign aid budget uh, goes to the Millennium Challenge Corporation. And the Millennium Challenge Corporation has many features about it which are uh, highly attractive to a career aid professional like me. But the, in the course of the 18 compacts that they've entered into so far, uh, none of them have, have a basic urban thrust is what they're all about. And only a couple of them address urban issues generally through water programs. So you've got this big source of potential funding for urban affairs being administered in a way that none of it or very little of it is so far gotten to urban affairs. So that's one part of, of the issue that we're concerned with. Now, quick, quick history. Uh, I, I, I joined aid in 1966, which is more than 40 years ago. At that time, I went there for the specific purpose of managing the housing guarantee program. I had been working with the uh, AFL CIO on programs for uh, social projects for Latin American trade unions. I had used the housing guarantee program to finance some trade union projects before I came to aid. The guarantee program at that time was a congressional initiative, and it had been put in place to help U.S. builders build housing in Latin America. Uh, a couple of years' experience had indicated that though that was a worthwhile program, it wasn't one that was going to be broad and general. It wasn't going to be a large, uh, statistically important program. And we wanted to figure out what to do with it. And so I stayed there and, 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 and uh, was there for 36 years uh, man managing AIDS urban affairs. The housing guarantee program was, was the reason why there was an Office of Housing. The, the agency recognized that it had a housing guarantee program to manage. It needed people to manage it, and so it acquired a staff with that expertise. We then designed programs that would help in slums and that would help organize thrift institutions and that would help with tenure, the different key issues in the program. But it started with the fact that given every year when, when AIDS sat down to make up its budget, it had a housing guarantee program, it needed a staff to manage it, and so we got the staff. Well, then when you got the staff, the staff got very sophisticated. The guarantee program was not a suitable instrument for many of the poorest countries in which we work. It, it, it brought market or semi-market value resources that would come at about the same interest rate as, say, an FHA mortgage available for this financing, and that was suitable for some situations and not for others. But because we had the staff there and the staff was knowledgeable, they then participated in the policy discussions about housing issues uh, across the board. And a number of situations arose in which large sums of money were available for the U.S. government to have it take initiatives in particular situations. Uh, a, a good example is um, the reunification of Germany. When the democratic world decided that they wanted to reunify Germany, a major obstacle was that the Russian troops in East Germany, the, the officers, could not go back to Russia because the government of Russia didn't have housing for them. As officers, they were entitled to housing, and if they took them out of East Germany, there was no place for them to live. This is liter literally true. And so the U.S. and German governments got together and put together a crash program to build a whole lot of housing for Russian officers, uh, which we financed and managed uh, with, with the aid program. Similar stories are true about the end of apartheid in South Africa, the uh, uh, change in uh, governments in Portugal when the dictator died, uh, a number of situations in which the housing expertise that we had was available to the U.S. government. When you have this kind of situation and you have to make decisions in a relatively fast period of time, you generally have a number of decision makers, half a dozen of them, four of them in a room together, and, and what they decide uh, how to whack up the pie then pretty much things get set loose and then the, the, the programs get set. Well, in the, in the 1990s, 
the Congress became apprehensive a, a, about the housing guarantee program because they felt that it, it, it had the potential to be another savings and loan uh, problem, that there was a large amount of, of guarantees out there and it wasn't clear that the risks had been, had been clearly planned for. Uh, I think that the apprehension was worse than, uh, than uh, the, the true problem, but because of that apprehension, they cut back seriously on the guarantee program. And then AID did not choose to use other resources to substitute for the guarantee program in order to keep the housing program going. So in the mid-90s, uh, it's also true that I personally got involved in environmental affairs. The Clinton administration set up uh, an environmental center, and I was the acting director of that for a while, and my attention was elsewhere. That's, that's a whole other story, which if any of you would like to be bored to death sometime, you can ask me about it, and, <laughs> and, and, and I'll tell you. But at any rate, starting in the mid-'90s, the, the AID stopped funding the housing programs or cut the funding way back, and that then led to a disbursement of the staff that was managing the program, a highly talented group of people, at least a half a dozen are here in, 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 in eyesight right now. Uh, to Friday, they'll swear in the new mission directed to Afghanistan, which is the biggest aid program right now, the most important. It'll be Bill Frey, a graduate of the of their RUDO program, the mission directors in uh, South Africa, in Jordan, uh, very major programs or people who were RUDO directors before they, they moved into the agency. So what we really need to do, in addition to the strategic uh, uh, laying out a strategy as, as called for in the slum legislation, is to get the personnel back together. We need to have a central office in, in, in AID, not necessarily the same kind of structure that we had when I was there, but almost certainly you won't have the same kind of structure. It, it'll be different in some ways. But you need a charismatic leader, you need a, 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 a minimum size office so that it would be able to have the capacity to influence the office. And combining that with the strategy, I think it can get back to where the U.S. will be very, very influential in the field. Thank you. Chris? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Blair. Um, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank both, both congressmen for sticking your neck out on this one. I think it's, uh, it's important um, that you've taken the initiative to put this in writing and, and, and to share it with everybody. Um, so first, uh, kudos go uh, very much to, uh, uh, to both of you. Uh, thanks very much. And, um, uh, while it didn't rain on your trip to Kibera, it was uh, certainly uh, quite a, a good exchange, I think, in terms of um, having the, the seven members of Congress interface with the planning committee. Um, and I think that's an Im important uh, reference for, for future. Um, I know you, you, both of you are asked to go on CODELs all the time, and you get pulled in different directions. But uh, um, from the perspective of uh, those that are trying to pursue issues of this kind, uh, CODELs are, are very strategic. Uh, I think it wouldn't have happened. Uh, uh, the, 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 mo the level of interest that you have in this issue right now would not have happened if you hadn't had the opportunity of a CODEL. Um, so I, I just wanted to put in a plug for uh, not only this issue but future issues. Uh, take the CODELs. I think they're very important. Um, UN Habitat uh, is the agency of the UN system that uh, focuses on housing and urban development. In many ways, it's the, the global HUD um, that, uh, within the UN system. Um, Habitat as an agency has actually changed significantly in the last 20 years, and I'd like to argue that I think that's a reflection of the fact that the issue is much more complicated than it was and much more intense uh, in terms of urbanization. We were previously a, a fairly marginal part of the UN system, a center for human settlements, um, part of ECOSOC. And then in 2001, uh, the General Assembly elevated UN Habitat to be a full program or member of the funds and programs, um, and when we uh, expanded quite significantly. Um, I think the, 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 the fact that the UN agency has responded to this issue um, is, is, is good news for the US government and its interest to try to elevate this issue. Um, I, I want to emphasize that there are at least seven major countries uh, in Europe uh, and North America that are struggling with the same challenge that you are as, as legislators. In other words, how to get their head around the issue of urbanization as it pertains to poverty reduction strategies in their foreign assistance. So the government of Sweden, 
Norway, Holland, uh, the United, United Kingdom, uh, Spain, uh, as well as Canada, are also wrestling with this same issue at different levels. Sometimes it's coming from the administration, sometimes it's coming from, from Parliament or, or uh, Congress, uh, other times it's coming from grassroots constituencies within the countries that are pushing for this. But in each case, they're all wrestling with exactly the same questions that you've outlined here. How does their foreign assistance capture this new demographic shift from rural to urban areas, this intense level of, of, of poverty that's unfolding in cities? Um, do they have one lead agency that takes this on and then others support it? Um, do they uh, try to uh, create something new, uh, or do they repackage what they already have? Um, do they establish a, a dedicated part of their administration to this issue? Um, CETA, 15 years ago, took that decision. They built up a huge urban focus, over 40 people uh, that were within um, their, their uh, uh, CETA, uh, the equivalent of USAID in, uh, in Sweden. Um, three years ago, the new administration came in and took a decision to cut the, cut the pie in a different way, and, and that uh, urban focus, that urban division that they had was eliminated. And then they're now focusing at it from uh, private sector and uh, market approaches as well as water and sanitation, what have you. So I, I, I just want to say that it's not two things. One, um, that you're not alone, that other countries are also struggling with this. Secondly, it's not a static situation. It's dynamic. Even if a country's decided to take this on, um, it might not be something that stays there in the longer term. And I think that's a, a lesson to you as you're going through this process to be very mindful of what kind of what kind of legislation can, can, can transcend um, changes in administration? What, what can be put in place that's a longer-term strategy uh, for dealing with this? Because we are, as, as is mentioned by all of you, we're looking at about 2 billion people um, uh, that are going to be living in slums by the year 2030. So the Kiberas and the places in, uh, in, in Latin America and Asia and, and, and Sub-Saharan Africa that you, you've seen are, are just going to increase in numbers. Our, our estimates are not just the mega cities, but also the, the cities that are at the, about 500,000 to 1 million. In Asia alone, we expect 5,000 cities of that size to emerge in the next five to 10 years. So, so we're, the magnitude of the problem is so enormous that it's, it's, it's not something that I think is going to be captured in a one-off project. It's, it's systemic change. And I think what your legislation is suggesting is, is a way to work towards that. And I think that the fact that you've aligned that to a larger initiative to look at foreign assistance reform is extremely strategic because you're, you're, you're anchoring this within a larger effort to update foreign assistance uh, in the 21st century. Um, I, I think in terms of what I'm hearing from other countries, and just to leave these as final words, because I really would th like to open this up for discussion and not, not dominate it, because I think you've registered the, main, registered the main points. I think part of the challenge that other countries are facing is constituency. <clears throat> what is the constituency for this issue in the United States? Largely, it's been the USAID community and the contractors and the NGOs, international NGOs, and like-minded folk uh, that are involved with this issue in different, different quarters. Um, since I've come to Washington as a representative in the last 18 months, I've really tried to reach out to a wide range of people. One of them is the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, um, the Business Leadership, Business Civic Leadership Center, and individual and multinational corporations. Now, you might say, well, what are you doing in that area? That's not really a key constituency for urban urbanization. Well, I have found in my work over the last 18 months that uh, the corporation Cisco, one of the largest hardware uh, structures, uh, hardware companies for the Internet, has a new initiative known as Intelligent Urbanization. It's a 30-year strategy for their contribution to deal with rapid urbanization. It might not be the perfect answer, but it's a multinational corporation with assets valued way over $25, $30 billion worldwide that recognizes that urbanization is a huge issue. They've decided to have one of their executive vice presidents located not in a, in a headquarters in the north, but to be based in Bangalore in India. So in other words, the person who's in charge with globalization and future market expansion is based in the third world. Now, I, I haven't explored this exhaustively, but I would think that in addition to Cisco, we'd want to be thinking and having a discussion and dialogue with other members of the U.S. Chamber, uh, pretend, particularly those in the information communication technology, as well as financial services. I think all of these uh, companies are recognizing that there's a huge constituency, uh, excuse me, a huge market for them in the delivery of their services because the current way that their services are designed is not reaching this huge population that's growing. Now, they're not looking at it necessarily from a poverty reduction perspective, although they, what they're doing has an impact on that strategy. 
Another constituency, I think, is the whole post-conflict, post-disaster community. Now, we've tended to look at this as a development issue, as poverty reduction. It turns out that Afghanistan and U.S. policy Afghanistan is one of the most comprehensive, integrated urbanization strategies that USAID has. We don't know it because it's post-conflict, post-disaster. It's, it's in another box that we all deal with. But if you scratch the surface and you get down to the details of what aid's doing in Afghanistan and what it will do, because we have now a, a Rudo graduate who's going to be entering as the, as the AID director, um, there is an enormous scope for precedents that have been set in the post-conflict, post-disaster, particularly on land and land regularization issues, re, um, reclamation of land issues and tenure security. So I think we need to, to diversify there. Um, lastly, I think if we, if we, if we look at the, the wide um, uh, uh, types of, of, of constituencies that are out there, we also have, I think, a potential opportunity for uh, exchanges. Um, there are n the, the urban experience in the United States is a unique one. It's, it's got its own trajectory over the last 100 years, and the way in which U.S. Um, organizations, uh, local governments, banks, um, uh, government leaders have dealt with urban development in this country um, has a, a lot of lessons learned. And I think there's an enormous opportunity to link in with that constituency to try to form partnerships and linkages with what's happening internationally. And I know your legislation touches on the edges of this, but I think it, it, we need to be thinking out of the box if we'd like to get these issues uh, to get the visibility that they'd like. So I just wanted to make those quick provocations and uh, uh, leave it at that. Thanks, Blair. Okay. Thank you. I know the representatives need to leave in about 10 minutes. So let me first ask if either of you have any questions or comments for the other panelists. Why don't we open it up and let me ask first for people who have questions for the congressman. Yes. We'll get you a microphone right now. Yes, good morning. Thank you. Nicole Millade with the American Red Cross. Um, I'd like to just make a comment, if I may. Um, and Congressman Miller, your description of the um, torrential downpour in Kavira reminded me of this important issue, which is uh, the particular vulnerability of these sorts of urban areas to uh, disasters resulting from natural or man-made hazards. And I just wanted to see whether there was room in this discussion for the imperative of disaster risk reduction programming. Thank you. Um, well, given the level of generality, <laughs> I'm sure there is room. Uh, um, but yes, it's not hard to imagine that uh, given the fragile state of the buildings, uh, the structures in Kibera, that it uh, would easily be wiped out. And I think I said earlier that in the post-election violence in December, uh, I guess that was December 2007, uh, January 2008, uh, a great many of the displaced people were in Kibera. Uh, and uh, their structures, their homes were, were destroyed. So it's, it's um, easy to imagine that it's uh, Given that there is absolutely no foundation, one one building, eight foot by eight foot, as David said, uh, barely barely big enough for a normal sized person to lie down, um, it's easy to imagine that they would be very vulnerable to any any kind of uh, natural disaster. Um, and there there is room in the discussion. That that's not one of the focuses at this point. But okay. uh, David Painter. Congressman, I, I also want to congratulate you on, on this uh, legislation, which I hope does make it into the uh, further reform package of... of uh, it, uh, Howard Berman was pretty encouraging on that. So I, I, I think there's a... You know, I haven't had a, a long, detailed conversation with him, but he knew that I was introducing it um, and welcomed it. So I think there's a pretty good chance. That's great. And, and of course, I know you're well aware that that's only the first step because uh, if you look at the history of what's happened with the legislation on uh, access for the poor to water and sanitation, uh, lots of dancing goes on to try and uh, keep it from actually ending up where uh, the legislation intended it. So it's only really the first step. But um, I want to congratulate you. I hope you don't mind if, if I now I'll refer to you and uh, to congressmen as slum dogs because I mean that in the best possible way. Uh, I think that one of the things that I wonder is how do you get more legislators from the U.S. to have this 
same experience that, that you've had of actually stepping into a slum, asking the hard questions, finding out that no one wants to give you those answers, uh, and, and understanding what's going on there in, in a sense that, you know, it probably will shock uh, most, uh, most congressmen and, and even senators. How do you get them there? I mean, what can be done? I'm not sure we need every member there. Uh, the way the the uh, way Congress works, and David is the political science professor who's written about Congress, is that it's a somewhat delegative uh, institution, um, and members uh, take uh, take an interest in certain issues. And as a practical matter, you aren't going to get anywhere close to 435 members uh, to walk through Kabira. But I think there's a um, there is a nucleus, uh, there is a um, critical mass of members who have paid some attention to those issues. I think the effect of walking through Kabira is the same on all of us. Um, uh, and I think that there are some members who are well placed. Uh, uh, David Price's Democracy Commission, um, uh, Nita Lowy. Uh, uh, actually, um, you know, there's a long history in the United States of um, ethnic Americans taking an interest in the the land of their origin. Um, you know, the Jewish community's concern for Israel, the, you know, uh, the Armenian community's concern for that part of the world, and, and, and on and on. Um, and although most African Americans have been in this country for as long as I have been, uh, as, my, as my family has been, uh, there's been a fair number, there are a fair number of uh, CBC members who have taken uh, an interest in Africa uh, and I think has, has really added to the focus on Africa. I mean, who would have thought that um, the issues surrounding uh, Sudan, southern Sudan and Darfur, but especially Darfur, would have gotten as much attention as they have in the United States? Um, it really is, it's not government leading the way on that, it really is citizen activists. Um, I, I met uh, last weekend with a group of high school kids and college kids who were worried about northern Uganda and the child soldiers there. Uh, so I think there is more of uh, the, the abducted child. I'm sure you know what, what that's about. Um, there is more interest um, on these issues than, um, than there might have been not, not so terribly long ago, including some people who are a reasonably well positioned in the Congress in Congress to do something about it. Let me uh, add a cautionary note, though. The the question that was raised uh, earlier about um, what is the constituency for this um, policy thrust that we're hoping to in encourage, um, I think, is probably going to be caught up in the larger issue of the um, constituency for for foreign aid, foreign support in general, and I, uh, I I have some apprehensions about that. We, um, we need to have both parties on board on this, I guess, is, uh, is the premise of what I'm about, about to say. This is, um, this is going to work only if we don't have one party uh, adversarial in terms of uh, of, of foreign aid and attacking it as wasteful and as um, uh, you, you know you, you're very well f familiar with the contours of this debate in the past the rather depressing contours of this uh, debate in the in the past and and one of the uh, one of the good things of course about uh, being actually being in office and having to assume responsibility is that you can no longer just lob grenades about issues like foreign aid. You have to take some responsibility. I, you know, when did we, when did we uh, finally get uh, this uh, UN arrearages uh, problem off of our back? <laughs> it took uh, it took nine eleven and Colin Powell and a Republican administration to finally put that issue to rest, at least uh, for the, for the most part. And uh, we have had divided government for uh, for a, a number of years, uh, and and unified Republican control for a number of years, which um, I think uh, forced a kind of uh, responsibility on on lots of players to uh, to uh, be uh, reasonably constructive in the area of foreign assistance. Now I think there's a risk. There's a risk of reverting to older patterns of. Um, of, of um, 
uh, opposition, which I very much hope won't happen. And I think people like yourselves who are involved in these issues, uh, you know, we really are going to have a special uh, responsibility, I think, for, for, for reaching out, for finding allies, and for uh, making certain people uh, know what we're doing and are, and are, uh, and, and have, a, have a compelling sense of what, um, what this is all about and, and therefore uh, resist the temptation to uh, take cheap shots. Let me um, add, and I do need to leave momentarily, but um, the other reason to do it, besides for its own sake, uh, which I think is reason enough and is reason enough for, uh, for a good many Americans, uh, is that it really is part of our national security effort. Um, uh, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Control, uh, climate change, excuse me, uh, the United Nations uh, group uh, said a couple of years ago uh, when they released a report that as a result of climate change, uh, food production in Africa was likely to be half in the year 2020 what it was at the time of the report. Uh, it is hard to imagine that if that happens, uh, there will not be famine, that l probably literally millions of people will die of starvation, uh, and it is quite possible that uh, the ungoverned, that many of the fragile governments in Africa will fall and become ungoverned regions. Uh, General Anthony Zini uh, said that ungoverned regions uh, with uh, harsh, uh, unbelievably harsh living conditions are petri dishes for extremism and radicalism. Uh, and our, it is in our national security interest uh, that life not be quite that harsh in other parts of the world, that the, um, uh, we, we refer to all but the most developed billion people in the country, in the world, as being um, uh, in developing developing economies, but the reality is that there's about a billion who aren't, uh, who are actually losing ground. Um, uh, Liberia, where the per capita GDP is about $120, um, uh, it's, not, it's no better than that in Afghanistan. Uh, if, if we don't do something, if we don't make it a priority to relieve that level of poverty, um, the world will, will not be a safe place. Thank you. I know that uh, Congressman Miller and Congressman Price will have to slip out, so um, I want to thank them for, for coming down. We, we will continue the discussion, but thank you, thank you very much. Okay. I saw a hand go up in this corner. Yes. We're getting you a microphone now. Yes, a, a question following on uh, Congressman Miller's comments. Um, to broaden the issue of cities and national security, he, he mentions uh, famine, a threat of famine destabilizing governments. Uh, how much traction does the argument have that the cities in themselves, apart from any sector, health or food security, the massive concentration of poverty in the cities are destabilizing societies and from a national security point of view we need to make sure that governments are stable and not havens for terrorists. Does that have any traction on the Hill? Well I think so. That's not to say it's at the top of everyone's consciousness. I mean I, uh, you know, there's some very powerful books and arguments uh, out now about the uh, this this new urbanization and this new phenomenon of uh, of uh, these mega mega slums and the kind of uh, threats they uh, pose, I think uh, various ways of raising consciousness are are are, are important. But uh, it, I, I think what Brad just said is is one of the most powerful points of connection with uh, what politicians might actually pay attention to and 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 feel like they need to respond to. We'll go over here. I notice this side of the room is quiet, but we'll go over here. And I'm David Grossman, uh, I'm representing the International City Managers Association. <clears throat> ICMA has been active <clears throat> as a USAID implementing partner for some 20 years, um, helping cities in developing countries manage better, providing services to their citizens, water, sanitation, garbage collection, streets, lighting, 
and uh, creating environments for improved local economic development. So um, ICMA is a professional domestic association of city managers, many members from the state of North Carolina as well, uh, active in our international work and committees. And uh, we also have 22 international affiliates with whom we work uh, around the world. So I, I just want to pick up on a couple points that you made, Representative Price. In terms of integration and, uh, and integrating services in cities and slums, local government is where that can happen in terms of uh, future planning for growth and management of services and, and a myriad of, of all kinds of activities, revenue generation, et cetera. Um, and the U.S. has a strong history and tradition in local government, and it's uh, something that we can bring to bear in, in this arena and, and that we are doing. Uh, also, similar to the parliamentary assistance that, that you mentioned earlier in, in the early days in Eastern Europe, where practitioner or practitioner assistance, um, that's another area um, that ICMA can bring. It's, a, it's local government practitioners who can roll up their sleeves and, and work with their counterparts uh, in developing countries and cities to, to get creative and, and make things work better. How extensive, uh, how much of that is un underway with your organization or others in terms of the peer-to-peer uh, -peer support for urban governance? Well, uh, ICMA has had a continuous uh, grant from USAID, and, and we work uh, with funding from other donors as well, and we've been active in, in more than 50 countries. And we've done hundreds of city links uh, is our flagship program where we partner cities in the U.S. Um, with cities in developing countries and establish these um, long-standing that relationships that go well beyond the, the funding, the life of the funding, because personal relationships, uh, city relationships are established, which, which continue uh, well past uh, project funding. Um, ICMA is, our, our largest projects are in Afghanistan, where we're working under the umbrella of uh, security and stabilization. That's, that's our box, but we're bringing all of our expertise in local government and urbanization to these areas, and our programs are, you know, uh, just growing because they are successful. Their uh, government is present in the communities uh, in, in in Afghanistan and providing ser services to the citizens of Af Afghanistan, involving them in uh, sports, the youth and sports activities. We, we we're working with thousands of youth doing soccer and cricket and getting them to volunteer uh, in local government. Uh, that's part of the conditions of uh, volunteerism is part of the conditions of participating in the sports and other activities. So um, I guess the message is uh, local government is uh, a hub that could really integrate services and, and, uh, and bring a focus to, to slum upgrading. Any other questions, comments, observations? Once more on this side of the room, Ron. I just want to make a comment about sort of a, a reality check in terms that donors and governments really, no matter if aid gets a lot more money to focus on urban issues, unless you promote public-private partnerships, you're never going to be able to go to scale because the magnitude of the problem is such that unless you have these public-private partnerships at the local level, at the state level, at the national level, and even at the international level, you're never going to get close to, to really addressing the core issues. And it's got to be a consortia of all the parties coming together. And I would hope that any legislation includes really promoting the concept of private public-private partnerships, because unless we bring private sector capital to the table, we're never going to get close to addressing the problem. Thank you. Um, since uh, Congressman Price is going to leave, I'm, I'm going to turn. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. You. I'm going to turn to Peter and Chris to see if they have any final observations, and then we'll see if there are any last questions. Anything you want to add at the moment? Uh, the, 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 this legislation is really a very important key step in a strategy to get where we want to go. And I think uh, Congressman Miller laid it right on the line. This is an attempt 
to influence the final legislation that comes out so that it comes out differently than it would without it. And obviously, uh, Chairman Berman is going to care more about what the members of his committee think than about the advocacy groups that, that come before them. I'd say that the principal task that uh, we see in front of us in the International Housing Coalition is to identify a champion at AID. That's, that's our major task. Um, I just want to thank you for pulling this off. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions, comments? There's a hand. Okay. Hi, I'm a, this sort of addressed to Peter Kim. Uh, I'm a sort of graduate of MCC, and I was wondering how much interest on the part of the part, uh, compact countries, I mean, that's where the projects come from, has been evinced in the area of urban. I know that the countries I worked in, the projects that were proposed were mostly infrastructure. They had to do with bringing the rural areas into the granted urban areas to market. But there weren't a lot of urban projects proposed. So I wonder, I'm wondering if a constituency that may not be tapped is the countries themselves and have some sort of advocacy. I don't know how interested they are in looking at urban, you know, projects. Yeah, well, they, they have a, a relatively large number of compacts now. And uh, doesn't it seem odd that none of those 18 or 20 countries, were, were nobody in any of those countries came forward with an urban project as the most interesting? There were two that are fundamental to the compact itself. Uh huh. Good. I'll, I'll take your word for it because well, I'm. They're not being funded. They were. Oh. <laughs> well, th those kind we. That's the kind we get. Yeah, the ones, the the, the ones that aren't funded. So uh, I guess our view is that uh, you have to look at the process. Who who are you consulting with when you say you're consulting with the host country? I think that the MCC principle that they're, they're going with host country selection is is absolutely right. But then, uh, as they, they always say, the devil is in the details. Who is the host country? Who's at the table? Who's in the participation? I think that uh, ideally uh, we would advocate within a country in an attempt to create a constituency, but the fact is we're not that big and strong yet. We, 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 don't, we don't have that kind of reach. And uh, we'd like to talk to MCC, and we are talking to MCC, and they're very intelligent and able people. Uh, about taking a look at their procedures to see how they could get a, a greater discussion of the pros and cons of urban programs built into their dialogue. They, they had a first, the first couple of projects were a, rural, a road in a rural area and the agricultural development around it. The next 19 proposals they got looked a lot like that all road in a rural area and the agricultural stuff about it. So it, it's sort of uh, in the details. Well, one Yeah. Urban projects are sort of, I think, realistically more than five years. So the question is, how do you define something that is doable within the parameters of an MCC project? And I think that's the trick to yeah. come up with something that can actually be accomplished in the period of time that the money is allocated to it. And that may be one of the problems with the structure of MCC. I don't know. Yeah, I agree with that. Thank you for raising the issue. Yeah. Chris, you wanted to add sure, something? Sure, just uh, quickly. Um, the, the issue of MCC is, is the tip of the iceberg. Um, World Bank country assistance strategies, you could name on one hand the number that are focused on comprehensive approaches to urban development. Um, uh, it's not just USAID, and it's, it's global. Um, most bilateral development assistance is also on that focus. Um, one, when you begin to look at this issue and you go country by country, you see that the gov governments themselves are quite reluctant to take on this urban issue. Um, both for a political constituency issue, it's very complicated. Um, a, a failed project is not good politics for them. Um, the way that the money's coming in, they have less control over. There's, there's all kinds of issues when you begin to get into this. Um, UN Habitat has tried to address this program at just about every level you can imagine, whether that's the Association of Local Authorities worldwide, whether it's the uh, U.S. Conference, uh, excuse me, the um, uh, uh, ministerial conference of uh, housing and urban development ministers in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. We have different constituents. We work with them. 
We work with the African Union and uh, Asian countries, the Monrovies, uh, you name it. Um, we also work with the World Urban Forum to try to elevate the issues. So we're, we're very conscious of this, concern, this issue, but we need to, in a sense, create a number of platforms um, that allow um, people to be sensitized to recognize that uh, there are options. It's not an either-or situation in terms of rural and urban. There are integrated territorial planning programs that, I mean, good, or, good rural development at this point is going to require good urban development. There's just no way around it. So uh, in my opinion, that there's, there's, there are a lot of arguments that can be put forward and examples, as is mentioned with the Columbia example. Medellin is extraordinary. And that's actually slum prevention. It's not just slum, uh, uh, slum, slum upgrading. It's, it's getting ahead of the problem, formation of new slums. Okay, uh, right here. Uh, thank you. Um, this is kind of a follow-up to the last question. Uh, is, is the mass migration of people from rural areas to the cities, is that considered almost inevitable? And is there anything that could be done to keep people in rural areas? Thank you. Uh, mostly your answer to your question is yes, it is inevitable that, that, that it can't be stopped. I think. Uh, Twenty years ago, uh, the World Bank concluded that the, the rural areas in, in the Near East uh, area were saturated, that there was no way they could absorb additional population with the resources available to them, that all of the uh, growth in population in those countries would end up uh, being, being growth in the cities. And countries with uh, in, in the Soviet Union and China where they had work permits to, where they, they tried to keep the size of the cities down by not giving people jobs the they evaded the system they, they, whatever way you evade the system in those societies so that cities grew grew anyway and that, that's really not a, not a winning strategy you can't keep them down on the farm that that, that won't work Chris honey yeah just to Re reiterate uh, Peter's point, um, Zimbabwe, 850,000 people forcibly evicted in a period of 48 hours. All of them are back. So, I mean, you're, we're dealing with a situation where even in undemocratic undem practices are not able to, to stop this. Um, I think uh, some of the more democratic approaches are also equally revealing. In the 1970s, Tanzania tried to do uh, a strategy of, of, of setting up eight uh, nodal cities. Um, and moving its capital from Dar es Salaam to Dodoma, which is in the center of the country. So in other words, it took a dedicated state intervention at the central government level to try to deal with this huge influx of people coming to one city, the capital city, for historical reasons. Um, and even in that condition, they had very limited resources, very limited ability to actually implement and execute the strategy, even though they had a vision for that. So you, you have a whole number of scenarios where it's been very difficult to handle rural urban migration and also the type of rural to urban migration. Uh, many smaller countries in sub-Saharan Africa are dealing with the primate city or the, the capital city where people are coming to and the, the challenge is to try to find ways not only to have people not uh, move from rural to urban areas but more importantly to where, which urban areas are they moving to. And I think this becomes a, a much more complicated strategy that uh, uh, needs to be thought about. But in general, um, even if you were to look at the existing population of people living in cities, the demand and the supply of basic services is so out of whack that uh, the question about future populations is almost secondary. Okay, I'm going to begin to uh, wrap, wrap up the session. Uh, Chris uh, thanked me for uh, organizing the meeting, and I want to really thank the people who made it happen. Uh, Samantha Raditz, Allison Garland, and Lauren Hertzer, who really um, Without them, there wouldn't have been any meeting. And so I, I want to close by thanking the people who need to be really thanked. And I'd like to thank all of you for finding the time to come out. Uh, this will be continued, I'm sure.